So can I ask uh, is there... uh, why why did India answer to you answer to virus attack? Because it's so warm in India? What is that? Is it because it is, it is so hot in India? Yeah, yeah it's very have... hot. Yeah. yeah, the effect effect was very less because of the heat and the temperature here. The temperature in certain parts of India is uh, as high as 45, 46 degree temperature. Yeah, Delhi at 45. 45 degrees. 45, so 46. That was a problem. So I think that that helped us uh, in controlling the disease rather than our own efforts. It is a nature which is guarding us. <laughs> so I think we are ready to go live now in a minute time. And uh, I'll, meanwhile, I'll just request uh, the uh, moderators. The, the moderators for today's session is Dr. Milin Pimprikar. Milin will be joining. Ranjit Pani Rahi. Ranjit is there. Hi, Ranjit. Yeah, hello. Hello. Hello, Rastan. Dr. Atik was there. Hi, Atik. Atik was there. Uh, Dr. Uh, Sanjay Trivedi, he is, he'll be joining us and Dr. Rajkumar Amravati. These are the moderators and we have many panelists as we proceed with the lectures. We are going to be joined by many of these panelists. I think out of that, Dr. Vivek is already here. Vivek? Yeah, Vivek yeah, he was here. Is here. He and, was here. Yeah, yeah. And Dr. Raghavir Reddy is here. I think we are waiting for Dr. Abhay Narvekar, Dr. Manish Maheshwari, Dr. Nilesh Kamar, Dr. Nishit Shah and Dr. Jaya Prasad and Dr. Karthik Selvaraj. So once I think people will join, Rajkumar is already here. Yeah. So I think we are ready to go live. I'll hand over this uh, podium to Dr. Uh, Ranjit Panigrahe and Dr. Atik was there and Dr. Rajkumar Amaravati to moderate the session. We have Dr. Lasing in Boston is going to speak on multi-ligament injury in elite athlete, his experience. Then we have uh, uh, Dr. Mark Strauss, he's going to speak on PCL rest a PCL reconstruction, how do we do it? And then again, we have Dr. Ma, uh, uh, Dr. Lars speaking on the return to sports after major knee injury. And then we, in the end, we're going to have a few case-based discussion. I think two or three cases, if uh, Lars has uh, made those ready, we, we are going to discuss in detail. So we have uh, 90 minutes, which is fixed for this symposium. We can extend up to another 30 minutes for two hours. So from uh, 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. is a uh, time. Uh, I'll hand over this to Dr. Ranjit and Dr. Atik was there, Dr. Rajkumar Amarati. Please go ahead, Atik. Dr. Rajkumar Salpan, Madi, moderate Madi. Rajkumar, unmute yourself. Yes, uh, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Uh, Dr. Lars, good evening. You, uh, you are, I'm audible? Yeah, yeah, audible, audible. Okay. Uh, we welcome you on behalf of the Arthroscopy Academy for this uh, session on... Um, Elite athletes outcome uh, after ACL reconstructions and the PCL reconstructions. And we are looking forward to hear from the expert on this uh, kind of pathology. We all know that uh, the amateur athletes can do well or not do well, but how do elite athletes perform? Let's hear from the expert, uh, Lars, and we welcome you, Lars. Thank you. Uh, you can share your screen and yeah. uh, proceed with the talk. Yeah, thank you. I Lars, I will just mute everyone. Yeah. I'll okay. mute everyone so that uh, you can speak very peacefully. Okay. Good. Yeah. You can go ahead, Lars. Thank you for uh, the invitation to uh, me and Mark. Uh, and we will uh, give you a little bit of data from our own research and the clinical situation here in Europe and specifically in Norway. I know that uh, you have lots of uh, military injuries in India. So I'm sure you actually could have taught me a lot in this. And what I will talk about is uh, maybe not that useful for you. So you have to let me know uh, when, uh, when we get further on here. Now this, this is a typical knee that you see, you know, and then you have, you fix it, it looks like this. There's a lot of screws, a lot of holes, a lot of grafts, and a lot of issues. And here's a patient uh, us from um, our university who was doing a trampoline jump and had this dislocation, including nerve injury and the vascular injury as well. That's kind of a typical patient. Uh, half of the patient comes from motor accidents, the other half from, uh, from athletics, but from sports. And so did he. So this is Norway. And, you know, uh, Sweden is here. Uh, North Pole is up here. 
and uh, Europe down here, and we live here in Oslo. This is our research center in the area, and this is where we're sitting right now. And the Norwegian Olympic Center is right up here. That's where all our elite athletes are. We work at university hospitals where we are professors. And then we also work with the athletes at the Olympic Center and do our research here at the research center. And so my background, as you probably know already, is that I, um, uh, I've uh, been a very active uh, clinician researcher the whole life from about 1984. And uh, I've been very active internationally in a sense that I have uh, uh, been working with ESCA, which, which is the European AYSSM, uh, and um, uh, editor of JBJS right now and uh, uh, BJSM as well. So I do follow. I don't do much surgeries anymore. I just once in a while be in the room, but I see patients um, both on Wednesdays and Mondays. So I'm very active clinically as well. Uh, disclosures for this talk, uh, we have um, research grants from Smith & Nephew and from Artrex and also from uh, Zimmer Biologics, we do some uh, uh, osteoarthritis research uh, for them. Um, and we have fellows and the fellows are funded by uh, Smith & Nephew in, uh, here in, in Oslo. Now this is our sort of knee dislocation group, research group I should say. You have uh, Mark Strauss here. Myself and then this is Gilbert Mache. Uh, he lives he is from Norway now, but he's coming originally from uh, Botswana in um, South in Africa. For this year, he's in Canada uh, at a uh, osteotomy uh, fellowship, but he's returning to Norway in a week or two. So the the three of us are doing most of this research. This is the research group in Europe that we have together, and uh, here you can, you can recognize some of the people from you know Switzerland. US um, and so forth. So we do a lot of international research because we have a very small country and we don't have enough patients to really do really good clinical research. Therefore, we do that in a joint uh, venture with our European friends and some American as well. Uh, I mentioned I would bring a couple of cases up. This is uh, the first case I had almost. Uh, this was 1998. B-jumper, you probably never see this B-jumper. In your life, but this guy was 48 years old, a little bit older than usual, uh, and he fell on 107 meters and um, he felt the uh, knee become loose and had a uh, patella tendon uh, rupture as well as all the ligaments in the knee and, uh, a, uh, and a um, nerve injury. The nerve, the... And then this is uh, from the US one. Here you can see the guy ha have a knee dislocation. I'll get back to him as we go along here. Just want to see you. This is a typical patient in the OR. It looks like this. And you know, although we find it very interesting, it is after all very unusual. If you compare it to all the orthopedic injuries altogether, it is less than a percent. So we, in our hospital, we see about 25 to 30 patients a year with a total knee dislocation suggested. So then you know a little bit more of it. Some of these patients will have uh, uh, as vascular injury, as this one has as well, that you have to deal with. I'll get back into that a little bit later on. Now, this is the classification we use in Norway. I think the Schenk Skink sorry, classification is the, probably the one you use as well. And it's uh, Schenk uh, number two, three, and four that we see the most of. And I'll get a little bit, get you some data on that uh, here very soon. Because some of these have fractures too. So when I talk about knee dislocations now, I will concentrate on the ligament and some cartilage and some meniscal issues. Now, we've seen about 400 cases since May 96. I used to live in the US. I came back to Norway in May 96 to be chairman of the orthopedic hospital at the University of Oslo. And since then, we have uh, assembled these 400 cases and those we have been following for many, many years. And in these patients group, about 6% will have arter arterial injuries. And about one fourth will have some sort of um, uh, perineal nerve injury. Now, when I speak about this now, keep in mind that I work in a level one trauma center. So all the major trauma in uh, our part of Norway comes to this center. Therefore, we have more cases than most uh, hospitals in Europe uh, when it comes to knee dislocation. 
Now, this is an injury pattern that you may be familiar with. Uh, we know in India, you have lots of uh, uh, motorbike accidents and things like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, uh, about 10% of these are only ACL, PCL. The majority are uh, include the medial side. And then there's a big uh, chunk of lateral sides as well, where you also many times have a uh, injury to the cranial nerve. And then uh, uh, in a few cases, there are uh, everything is gone. So this is maybe what, uh, what you have in India as well. Now we practice delayed primary surgery in these patients. Of course, some of them are so sick or have some other issues that we have to deal with first. But for the most part, uh, we do the surgery within seven to 10 days. And uh, we uh, start out by stabilizing the knee, uh, surgical vascular in injuries, uh, and then we check our allograms so we have enough of that. They plan and discuss the surgical procedure, and then discuss the patient um, in the, with the patient in the hospital. Usually, the patient is in the hospital one or two days before the surgery happens. So then we have an evaluation phase where we, you know, look for possible vascular injuries. In this case, also these 400. Only eight patients had that. And then we do a CT angiogram if we suspect it. And then, then that will pick that up very easily. And then you know that uh, amputation rate is quite high if you recirculate after six hours. And if it, it, even, it is even higher if you recirculate after eight hours. So you know, it's very important to be able to recirculate the limb within the first six hours because then you have very few amputations. In this material, we had two amputations. Now, uh, if you have a pulse left foot, which happens now and then, uh, you know, you need to do immediate surgical exploration. And uh, you may not have time to do a CT angiogram, uh, but I think you guys have more experience with that than we do uh, in our hospital here in Norway. During that evaluation phase, we evaluate all the ligaments, the usual tests that you are very familiar with. And then you just have to be careful about looking into a patella tendon, cordyceps tendon, and then also if there is a kneecap dislocation. Uh, and all this is clinical, although we do have MRIs, of course. Because the MRI uh, uses the usual sequences, nothing special about that. And the MRI will help you in looking for uh, meniscal root tears, help you in looking for chondral injuries, and it might be some small fractures that you might have to take care of. So the MRI really helps us in the surgical planning. And you know, you look for all the stuff that I showed you now when you do the MRI. And um, uh, we have MRIs of all these, of course. I think you also have pretty good access to MRIs in, where you are in your big hospitals and big cities in India. Now, this is interesting because these are this, um, different studies looking at the number percentage of vascular injuries or of uh, perineal nerve injuries. And as you can see here, this all depends on what kind of setting you have. If you have a sport setting like Shelburne, you have very few vascular injuries and not so many nerve injuries either. Then if you are at a uh, uh, trauma center like we have, we have uh, much higher uh, perineal nerve injuries, for example, so when you study these kind of so these kind of papers, you have to be aware of the fact that they could come from a trauma hospital or from a uh, sports hospital. Um, the nerve injury incidence is very high, depending on whether you are on the lateral side with your injuries or not. And in our case, and I'm sure you um, agree with me on that. So if the nerve is completely out, both sensor and motor, then the nerve will not uh, usually recover. But if it is partially out, then it will almost always recover. So most of the patients we have have recovered. In our hands, we usually do a tibial transfer, tendon transfer after six to 12 months if nerve is totally out. We do not do nerve transfers, transplants, because they, um, that really hasn't uh, uh, been very helpful other than in a couple of places in the US. Uh, so this is the damage I said about the nerve here in my own experience. So if you at least have something going for that nerve when you have the patient at the first week or second week, then usually you can tell him that within six months, the nerve will be back. 
And then usually in the, when you had the observation phase, if you keep the patient in the hospital, you keep it on the CPM. Uh, and, uh, and if there is a vascular length damage, of course we will, uh, excuse me, if there's a vascular damage, we will of course fix, have an external fixator if it is fixed. Um, be aware of the fact that you can have vascular late damage. This has been published before. One of my patients were 82 years old, hit by a car, and after about two, three days, she had interval to care of her uh, uh, popliteal artery and had to be uh, fixed. This can happen. This is le um, much less usual. Compartment syndrome is usual in, in these patients as well if they have car accidents. So be careful with that. And, you know, as you know, no associated injury, and that will prevent you from operating in the knees uh, if they have a major thorax or a abdominal injury. So. Okay, so I said that uh, you have some time before you do the surgery while you're checking up on the uh, popliteal artery. Then you can uh, think about the grafts. And I know that uh, it's going to be different from India and to Norway. We use a lot of allografts. And uh, some of us prefer autographs. But we almost always use allografts for PCLs when it comes to uh, uh, knee dislocations. Uh, most of the other stuff we use uh, autographs. Um, and you have a selection of allografts uh, in our freezer. Uh, so we use, uh, use Achilles tendon for posterolateral, we use um, tip, tip tendon or Achilles tendon for PCL. And Mark will talk about that later. Uh, if you use allografts, uh, it takes longer. You have to be more careful, keep them longer in the brace. And uh, the results, overall results at the end of the year, first year and second year, may be the same as it is uh, for autographs when it comes to knee dislocations. A surgical phase, uh, you test the patient um, in anesthesia as well. And you do an arthroscopy, and people are asking me, how can you do an arthroscopy in a patient with major knee ligaments? Injuries, both lateral and medial. And actually, if you wait for seven to 10 days, you can usually do an arthroscopy without much extravasation. The only time I've seen extravasation that was big was when I had a patella tendon rupture at the same time, or like a huge medial side injury. So usually you can do arthroscopy. So you see ACL, single bundle, bone patella tendon usually, PCL, double bundle, Mark will talk about that. Uh, yeah, no, this is not all this stuff you have to do. Uh, it usually takes uh, between two and three hours, and we are always two surgeons, two or three surgeons uh, doing this. Um, and you know, uh, here you can see the holes in the tunnels. Mark will talk about uh, how you avoid tunnel convergence. So, what's the needed anatomical knowledge? Well, you have to know the lateral side, and I would say that uh, you know uh, the papers have been written on uh, posterior lateral. It's probably very good on surgical anatomy, so I would uh, urge you to go through those. Same thing on the medial side, it's easier um, uh, anatomy, uh, but you need to know it if you're going to be a dislocation surgeon. Now this is uh, Gilbert uh, in the uh, Colorado mountains. He was working there uh, for two years actually to look at uh, the placement of the tunnels and to avoid tunnel convergence. And Mark will talk about that later on so you know how to angle your uh, your um, source and stuff when you are going to use your drills and you're going to make those tunnels. Because it's a major issue about, uh, I will drop those here. Okay, so then you prepare for surgery. And then you, you know, you should discuss with your surgical team what you're going to do. And um, you make sure you have all the instruments. And I like to, um, go through with the, the nurses or the nurse what we're going to do, the plan, okay, of course. Sometimes you have to deviate from that a little bit, but this is the general order of it. And uh, this is what I like to do. I like to put a um, piece of paper on the wall newer uh, with a number such as this. This is what we're going to do and then this. Then they know what we're doing, they know next step, and uh, it's easier to have them following it and they'd be more interested in it uh, when you have something like this. And, uh, you know, when we scope them, we fix the root tears almost um, as number one because it needs to be easily accessible. We don't uh, tie the, don't fix it uh, until at the end, 
that we fix uh, put the sutures through uh, the tunnels and fix the root tears uh, very, very quickly. Here you see our drawings from our root tear paper, uh, what kind of root tear you can see in some of these mutations. ACL is a usual thing. Uh, we use single bundle ACL. Uh, we have had a study on double bundle and we compared it to single bundle and there is no difference two years down the road. So we keep on doing single bundle ACL. PCL, we have developed a new double bundle method with the rubber lab in um, uh, Colorado in Vail. And this is another Norwegian surgeon who is doing his uh, PhD, doing double bundle uh, down in uh, Vail. And uh, what we found was that um, compared to our results with single bundle PCL, double bundle seems to have an advantage. And also in the lab, in the biomechanics, it is clearly much better with double bundle. Also, in the PLT posterior lateral corner, uh, as you can see here on the uh, anatomy picture here, uh, usually that is really messed up, and you have to be able to recreate the normal method. And that's what we try to do uh, when we do this. Uh, and uh, usually we will reconstruct um, LCL, Pocketier's tendon, and PL, PFL. Uh, and that's a technique that we described many, many times. So we probably see that uh, both at conferences and in our, in our publications. Now, sometimes, you know, we have chronic cases like this. And if the patient has uh, very stress, like you go like this, because that means that uh, your postulateral corner and probably ACL and PCL are gone, then you need to do a, a, a steostomy first. But this is, of course, not for acute cases. This is for the chronic case of the North Elite Sport people. Just to remind you of these uh, studies, um, the anatomy study, the postural lateral study, uh, the uh, effect of osteotomy when you do that, and then uh, the analysis, analysis of uh, the clinical uh, result in patients that you are using, uh, uh, using the postural lateral knee reconstruction thing. And that, those results have been invariably quite good. So we have continued uh, to do that. I know that there is development on um, avoiding a uh, allograft, for example, using an autograph instead. And also there's a Chinese uh, guy who does this uh, arthroscopically, which is very impressive. And this, this is the, uh, it looks like this, uh, as you can see, you may have remembered even, um, and the two graphs, and we reconstruct them, the LCL, the POL, and the, uh, uh, and the proper, LCL, Pupitas, Tandem, and PFL. Uh, the results are reasonably good uh, in these patients. We follow them for two years afterwards. And we have a very good uh, follow up. We have more than 90% of the patients show up. So we can really study our results and uh, change, do changes if we have to do that. Now, on the medial side, we published again in uh, JBJS in Aptomiovit. This is our team when we did this several years back. And this may not be a good, be a bad idea to take a look at uh, if you want to do surgery on the medial side of the knees here. Uh, and we publish a current concept review uh, that I would recommend for you. The thing here is that you, you have a medial side injury with or without PCL ACL. If there is value scapping at zero uh, degrees of flexion uh, and uh, or gapping of uh, at 20 degrees at uh, more than six weeks, then uh, you need to do something about this. And we also do more medial side probably than the, otherwise uh, when we have need dislocation. So this is something we do uh, relatively, relatively frequently. This is an augmentation using a semi-T. You can use either an allograft or an autograft. And instead of taking another graft, you can use that um, hamstring uh, that you already have there. Uh, and most of the time when we do uh, MCL, this is the way we do it. But then, and sometimes you have no help from the hamstrings, hamstrings may be used before or it has been injured. Then you end up with a full um, reconstruction of the medial side where you reconstruct the POL here and the uh, office superficial MCL here. Uh, so we do that sometimes as well. Uh, and the outcomes uh, are, uh, 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 not as good, I would say, as on the postural side, but still, this is a technique that we like to use at, at this stage, and we have done some diplomas or that, things like that. Now, uh, I said that uh, uh, Mark will talk about uh, tunnel 
uh, issues. But also we have another issue that, that is graph tensioning. When you have uh, eight graphs, what's going to tension, be tensioned first and second, third, and last, and things like that. And Gilbert has published a study on this, and it shows that uh, basically that uh, uh, we rub that they start with PCL, fix it proximally, and you uh, fix it distally first. Then you have a uh, AP uh, control, more or less. And then you uh, do the um, ACL in full extension, and then you do the corners afterwards. The last uh, you will do will be the medial side, uh, the uh, lateral side after you do uh, PCL, ACL, and lateral side. Yeah, PCL, ACL, PLC, after ACL, so forth. And that's important to know. And of course, there are many ways of uh, cleaning a cat, and then this is one way of doing it. I'm not saying this is the only way you can do it. We have wise, um, it is difficult uh, because of the uh, injuries on the sides, medially or laterally. You'd like them not to be awake very much. Uh, in the OR, when you're doing your surgery, you make sure you have a safe face tone from zero to 90 at least, and you stress full extension the first days after surgery. And then they work on their uh, range of motion, their strength, and then the peripheral section at the, at the very end. And actually, at our place, we use a PCL brace for as much as six months, but usually uh, six weeks plus six weeks, uh, 12, 12 uh, weeks altogether. And uh, I told you that, uh, that we have good follow ups on these. The one thing I want to show you about that is if you have any big injury like this, you get much more OA in the knee if you follow them for 10 years. These are followed for more than 10 years. Almost half of them had Helgen Lawrence, one or two meaning that they had initial starting mild away already after 10 years uh, compared to, you know, this is done up ACL, single ACL. And uh, if you follow 10 years, there's much more away in these patients than in the single ACL or PCL. The clinical results are good, but the uh, uh, OA shows you that there's still a big problem and we can be improved. However, out of the 400 patients we've had, all with knee dislocations, so far only six of them have had uh, uh, the total knee replacement. So back to our patient at the very end. Well, this guy, you know, was ski jumper. We fixed his patellar uh, uh, ten, ten ligament, this one, and we fixed all the other stuff, just like I talked to you about. And he actually came back and did uh, ski jumping. Now, uh, here you can see his rehab. And he is now lifting very high and uh, doing very well, working full time as a carpenter and um, won the bronze medal in the uh, old boys ski championship uh, in 2009. This guy. Yeah, so you can see that he did very well. This is one year after he had his knee dislocation. So it is possible to come back. Uh, finally, our trampoline patient here, uh, he did have a um, artery injury. Uh, the nerve was uh, patched and explored, and the uh, external, external fixator was put on. We also had a tibial plateau fracture, which was fixed at the same time. Then later on, we did uh, the uh, knee dislocation stuff with the uh, PCL uh, two bundles, ACL single bundle, and so forth. And he had a dynamic brace on for 16 weeks. He's back doing skiing. He's a coach, no more skiing for himself. Uh, and he is back at full work now, two years after this injury happened. So the needed knowledge in these dislocations are you have to be an accomplished ACL surgeon. You have to know about the lateral and medial side. You have to have a, be a regular PCL surgeon, in my opinion. And you need to know anatomy on the medial side. So you have to have access, I would just say, to a master surgeon if you don't do it yourself. Uh, and you have to have a very good rehab team if you're going to do this. Otherwise, the knees will be stiff very early. So the take home message for this is to consider early surgery. Uh, we like to do it the first two weeks. We look especially for perineal nerve and vascular injuries. The outcomes are good functionally, but patients still have osteoarthritis after 10 years. And there's no doubt there's more research needed in this field. So thank you. This is uh, Rob and me uh, and my dog in, in Norway. He was visiting up here. This is our um, 
needed location course that we run once a year in um, Vail. And uh, this is uh, sponsored by Smith and Nephew. So those of you who are not been to that course, I would recommend that you uh, talk to your Smith and Nephew ref, Eric, and then ask him to uh, bring you there. Because that's a very good hands-on course. Cadavers two and a half day that week, and you get to operate them. Thank you. Thank you, Lars. Thank you, Lars. Sure. But uh, I am not sure if Roshan, the audio was clear or there was some yeah. issues. No, 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 audio is clear. No. Audio, audio clear. is clear. Yeah. At yeah. our end, probably there is some issue. I couldn't hear Lars very clearly. The paper is open for discussion. Uh, Vivek, Atik, Roshan, uh, yeah. Samantha, sir, if you have any questions to Lars, kindly pose it to him. Lars, I have a, I have a first question to you on uh, the sequence of uh, ligament tightening. Uh, you have studied the uh, this paper was uh, published by Dr. Uh, Chala from USA, uh, along with Dr. Rob Laprat. And uh, sequence was ECL first, the ACL second, and the PLC was behind ACL. I didn't understand how does the mechanics of PLC will not influence the ACL tightening first. Yeah, so the question is, um, again, the uh, tensioning, uh, uh, where you're tensioning it. I told yes. you that uh, we start out with PCL yeah. uh, at zero and uh, 60 to 90 degrees, two different uh, bundles. Mark will talk about that. Then you have good control of your um, uh, line alignment. And the second one would then be in full extension. You tighten the uh, ACL. And then uh, you uh, go to the posterolateral corner to fix that. Because if you fix posterolateral corner before the ACL, the tibia will rotate uh, externally and it will change the alignment of the tibia on the femur. Therefore, you have to um, tension the central uh, elements, uh, meaning ACL and PCL, before you do, uh, especially the posterior lateral corner, and then we do the posterior medial corner at the very end. You just have La to be careful when you do it so that you can do get La large, the large the same yes. mechanism, same mechanism. Tibia is going to extra rotate when you tighten the PCL. So similarly, tibia will extra rotate when you tighten the ACL because you already ex externalized the tibia. Tibia is already already extra rotated. It's 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 very true, but in contra in contrast to the external fixer, or not external fixer, but the the peripheral stabilizers, you get a much less rotation, and of course you have to be aware of that. So you have to pretty much have four hands working at the same time. You need one to fixate the knee. So what we typically do is the first one we take the anterolateral bundle on the PCL and tension that in 90 degrees of flexion. What you can do there is you can uh, prep the other leg so you have so that comparison leg to find the right uh, sagittal placement of, of the tibia, which is very difficult. So what I normally do there is I put my two hands on the tibia and make sure I have that right step off that I want on the tibia in contrast to the femur. And I control the rotation as much as you can. Of course, there's always the soft tissue issue. And then we put it in full extension and we tighten the second bundle of the PCL. And it's more the second bundle that, that, uh, that's, that gives you the, the external rotation actually. Um, and then you do the ACL. Yes. Yeah. We have a uh, yes. Uh, Swanendo, you have a question? Yes. Yes. As uh, um, Professor Lars and Rob Laprath has told us that when you go with the multi legs, you have to go with the first with the extension to lock the knee. Then we from the extension you go back to 90 degree for the AL bundle of your. your PCL first, then you go with the uh, your second bundle of the PCL. Then in full extension, you go with the ACL. Last, please explain uh, whether you use the fluoro in that case also, or you go from the extension to 90 degree. How you go ahead with your ACL and PCL? Because that is always the tricky question. I use uh, the fluoro the first, uh, in the first two years I did PCLs. I always use the fluoro to make sure my uh, insertion point on the tibial side was Hello? correct. Uh, but these days I do it without the fluoro 
and I um, am able. I think I'm able to get the alignment okay. What do you think, uh, Mark? I agree. I mean, the fluoro on the PCL side is one thing, but the fluoro on the a uh, repositioning side of the neatest location is another thing. We don't traditionally use a fluoro in the OR to make sure that we're aligned on the knee in a sagittal plane, but it's definitely a helpful tool, especially in the obese patients, which we do have in Norway, not in the same amount in the US. But if you have a very obese patient, it definitely is a helping tool to have fluoro available when you do your tightening of, of your grass and tensioning. Do you use fluoro in your hospital in India? Yes, yes. Yeah, because we, in the, the multi, multi leagues, we use the fluoro. And always you have taught us that the first you go to full extension, go the, go the, go the PCL and ACL, then you lock the knee and extension. Then you gradually fret 90, then 30, and then full extension, you fix the ACL. Am I correct? According to your thinking process, whatever you have told us. It's, it's true. It's, uh, that's the proper way of doing it. I think what we have probably done over the years is we have made some minor adjustments uh, out of practical uh, perspectives. It makes it a little bit easier. So we are surgeons coming from different hospitals that saw United here in Oslo. So we have also different angles of doing things. And I think we landed on a, a way of doing it here that at least I do at least, I do, I tension the anterolateral bundle first on the PCL. Yes. yes. Uh, in a flex at, knee. At, at, at 90, at 90. Yeah. But for me, and what I do there is I don't fix the, the graft on the tibia. What I do is I put my thumb on there and then I put it in full extension to make sure there's no traction and over-tensioning of that graft. And if I feel I'm in a, what I feel is an isometric point, then I go back to the 90 degrees flex and I, I fix it at that 90 degrees. And one of the reasons why I don't like to use staples is that you have to pound the staple into the tibia and you get a posterior dislocation, no matter how hard you try to hold that. That's why we like to use screw fixations. Yes, Mark, sometimes back you told us the, during the demonstration in the cadaveric lab that you, you are using the spiked wasser with your screws for the double cortex fixes. And do you still do that or else you go back to the your whatever the prof has shows us that the, you use the metallic uh, screws? We, we still use the spike washer and the bicortical screw. However, we have modified that a little bit. We use it just on the one bundle. So we use it on the anterior lateral bundle then once we put our knee in full extension to, tie, to, to fix the posterior medial bundle, we actually use an interference screw in the tibia. This okay. has been debated heavily on the Vix and Mackey's course every year, actually, and we haven't concluded on it. There's, it's a split uh, opinion on that. There's no scientific evidence. My argument for it is that you cannot have two independent graphs healing independently in the same tunnel. So for me, putting an interference screw in as your second stabilizer and your second graft, I'm sure that works equally as well as putting two bicortical screws in the tibia. We have uh, two, two, two YouTube questions, which have been uh, uh, on YouTube. I'll just read one by one. Uh, both the questions are to Dr. Lars. Uh, Lars uh, Dr. Lars, Dr. Ranjit wants to ask that popliteal fibular reconstruction is from static bone of fibula to the static bone of tibia. Isn't a, a popliteal fibular ligament is a mobile structure as it is attached to the popliteus tendon. So how does the that reconstruction work? That is the first question, Lars. Yeah, the um, uh, reconstruction is that you are uh, re, uh, constructing the uh, popliteus tendon from the insertion site on the femur until the insertion site on the um, uh, fibula. And then you are adding in the PFL uh, that goes from the fibula to uh, tibia. Of course, um, we are aware of the fact that uh, PFL is a dynamic because it's part of a muscle uh, and it's not an anatomic, totally anatomical uh, way of reconstructing it, but it does help in um, uh, stabilizing the posterolateral uh, instability. So the, both the popliteus tendon now when we can reconstruct it is a very solid structure same goes for the PFL, which becomes a very solid structure. And together, they're able to um, uh, have a very solid and tight 
postural lateral, uh, uh, you know, lateral reconstruction. That's the reason why I don't, I'm a little bit skeptical on using hamstrings for that because I know people that do not have allografts like to use hamstrings instead. It may be um, good, but I, I would like to see that they're able to have a stability that will last for more than a year when you use hamstring instead of uh, what we use the allograft. Uh, do you have any comments on that, Mark? No, I think, I mean, there are still some issues in the postulateral corner. We're talking about static and, and dynamic stabilizers. And, and one is, is the PFL, but the other is also the popliteal tendon, which is also a, a dynamic stabilizer, but we're making it a static stabilizer in the anatomical reconstruction. So it, it's, it's, it's a bigger picture that's uh, difficult to solve perfectly. But I think looking at the, the studies from the prop in this group, it's definitely the best solution we have at the moment. Yeah, there is another question uh, on YouTube is related to uh, any reason why fixing the lateral side before the medial side, because the chances of failure of lateral side is higher than the medial. Any reason why we choose the lateral side first before the medial? What, Lars? Uh, no, not really. I mean, uh, from the biomechanical studies in our lab, we showed that uh, if we did um, uh, medial before, or if we did uh, medial before the postural lateral, it tended to be off as far as alignment was concerned and rotation, because the postural lateral corner uh, is very decisive for how the tibia moves on the femur, and that's why we uh, want to do PCL, ACL, and then postural lateral. And then we have a stable construct. It's much easier to place your grafts or your repairs on the medial side. So that was, that was uh, our experience from the, uh, all the lab uh, cadavers studies we did over, the, over, the, over uh, almost a 10 year period. Yeah. Yes, yes Raghu, yes. Uh, Lars, you prefer only the screw fixation, interference screw fixation in all your uh, reconstruction? Uh, yes, I would say so. Uh, you know, there are different ways, different screw types, but we use interference screws on, um, uh, I would say, almost everything. Once in a while, there might be a, uh, uh, of course, for um, for uh, meniscal roots and stuff like that, there's something else. But for the ligaments in tunnels, I have preferred to use metal screws, actually, because metal you can see on the uh, x-rays, uh, and I don't like... Um, bio screws because of there's some issues about sign whites and stuff like that. So I'm old fashioned. I use the cheapest and that's the metal screws. Yeah, we do. Yes, because so some issue of sign white is re reaction with the bio, bio screws. And yes. do, do, you, do you augment the graphs with fiber tape or anything? I am, you know, I'm old. So when I started out almost in the 80s, I did uh, something called uh, LAD, ligament augmentation device, which was made by 3M. And actually my PhD thesis is on that one. It did not work uh, more, than a few, more than a few months. And they created some sinuitis around the knee, just like other uh, artificial ligaments. So I'm very skeptical. I don't, do not use any um, augmentation uh, or plastic in the knee at uh, this stage. Yes, Vivek, Vivek is waiting. Russell, Vivek is waiting. Vivek, Vivek yes. <laughs> Hi Lars, um, thank you for enlightening us on this uh, multi-leg injury. I just want to know if you have to, you know, do the stage. What is your take on stage versus single, you know, time reconstruction? Are both fine, or you know, the stage is also fine? Yes, and so if your you question. To, if if you have to space between the stage and the second one, what should be the timing? Yeah, so your question is uh, whether, whether we stage it at all, or if we do, how do we do it? The answer to that is that we prefer not to stage it. Okay. We like to do everything at once, usually within seven to 10 days. Okay. Sometimes, sometimes you know, uh, we cannot operate um, because of other issues. Mm -hmm. And then we uh, tend to um, have a brace on the patient, and then we try to do uh, the surgery at about three, four months when the knee has quieted down. But okay. if, you know, all the 400 patients that we've had that we follow, 
I would okay. say the vast majority of those have been operated on within uh, two weeks. I, I, all I all three or four ligaments together. Yeah, I can't remember we've had a case that's been staged. Either we do everything initially, <laughs> super acute phase within the two weeks, okay. or we postpone it till three to six months post of, of, after the injury. Okay, can I ask in the, in the same series, so let's say there is some compulsion to stage. So what is more biomechanically better? Let's say I'm giving an example of ACL, PCL and posterolateral corner. And maybe second one is ACL, PCL and posteromedial corner. So is it always better to do the corner and PCL together and then do ACL later or do the corner now and do the ACL, PCL next sitting? I mean, biomechanically, what do you think? Should we restore the PCL at the same time? I think that, uh, you know, we are not using the PCL itself to fix things. We are reconstructing it. Mm -hmm. So in that case, uh, if I had to stage it, I would just brace the patient and uh, not thing at all. If someone told me I had to stage it, um, I would probably uh, probably do uh, ACL and PCL and stage the uh, posterolateral and medial. But I'm not sure about that. I think from the, the biomechanical study from Gilbert uh, showing the, the sequence of tensioning, it speaks a lot for if you're staging that you stage the initial stage is the central part and then you go peripheral. Because if you do a posterolateral corner without PCL, ACL, you're gonna have a malrotation, I think. It's gonna be very, very difficult not to do it a, a, a malrotation on that. And then you're gonna run into trouble. So Strauss, according to you, if you have to stage, you do the center first and then do the periphery. Exactly. And this is based on, on Watts' studies on, on tensioning sequence. Because I think you're going to run into the same issue as in a tensioning sequence. That if you tension peripherally first, you have a much greater chance of having a, a wrong rotation of the knee in contrast to do it going central first where you minimize the malrotation. Okay. Thank you. Lars, Lars. Yes, just Dr. Narvika, yes, you can hear. Us. We just wanted to know what is the uh, status of the sabulofibular ligament and the posterior oblique ligament towards the stability of the knee as we go forward. So any type of research or thought in terms of uh, reconstructing them or their function in terms of stability to the posterior lateral cord? Uh, could you repeat that? We didn't understand that. What is the status of the fabulofibular and the posterior oblique ligament towards the stability provided by them to the posterior lateral corner of the knee. We have, uh, you know, decided to ignore them. And I've yeah. been giving a lot of uh, importance to the popliteus tendon and the popliteofibular ligament for the last 20 years. So is there a particular reason why they have been biomechanically or functionally neglected? Well, you're talking about the lateral side, right? And the medial, the POL. Yeah, okay, for the POL is easy. That's uh, if, the yes, patient has, yeah, if the patient is loose on full extension uh, and there is a stress x-ray showing a uh, big gap in the medial side, then we know that it's not enough to reconstruct the superficial MCL. You have to add the POL. So the POL belongs to our armamentarium for big time medial side. When it comes to the lateral side. No, no. My so, Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Dr. Narayan. Sorry, please continue. No, no, let him continue. Yeah. I thought he didn't understand. Yeah. Fabulo fibula. Fabulo fibula. So, sorry, can you repeat that? I think, no, you, I, was gonna... I, I think you are talking about uh, the postural lateral side, and you're yes. talking about ALL. Uh, no, no, no. No, no, no. I'm, talk I'm talking about the fabulofibular ligament and the That's posterior right. oblique ligament on the lateral side, the posterior lateral yeah. side. For some mm -hmm. reason, we have neglected it for the last uh, 20 years. Any particular reason? Does it not contribute anything towards its stability or the, the popliteus is enough? That the the um, uh, popliteus is enough. The uh, uh, fibula patel or um, what you, you're talking about, we, we just... Uh, don't never reconstruct. We only reconstruct uh, popliteus tendon and the uh, PFL. 
those are the two that we reconstruct when we have postural lateral injury issues. And on the medials LCL. and LC, LCL, of course. So LCL, popliteus tendon, and PFL. Medial side, sometimes superficial, sometimes uh, popit, uh, sometimes uh, POL, posterior oblique ligament. Those are the key ligaments for us on the medial and lateral side that we reconstruct or repair. But actually, let me just add that repairs of those ligaments, mid substance structure does not seem to work. That's why we're doing reconstructions with the autographs or something else uh, when we have that kind of injury. Oh, Lars. Yep. Uh, Dr. Lars, the question, question was different. What uh, Dr. Narvika sir is asking is, we are reconstructing posterolateral corner with popliteal fibular ligament popliteus and LCL, but why we are not thinking of fibulofibular ligament? I don't think that fibulofibular ligament has any role, big role on the postural lateral side. Because based, this is based, that statement is based on all our biomechanical studies. We never found a big um, role for that ligament on the postural lateral side. Okay. Uh, Roshan, if there are no more questions, uh, can yeah. you take the second yeah. talk? Yes, yes, we'll go ahead with the second talk. I'll request Dr. Mark, Mark Ross. And yes, you start Dr. Here. Lars, uh, we'll no, no. request Mark to go ahead with this talk, please. Okay. Let's see, we'll find it. Uh, um, PCL reconstruction. Yes, so we're just going to find a talk here. And I don't think, can you see this now? No, no, you, you have to open the presentation, then go on Zoom icon, then share the screen. Sh share your screen. Wait a second, I'll, uh, yeah, no, I'll just uh, read you it. Uh, yeah, yeah. We're just going to try with two machines linked up together here. Uh, yeah, there's something happening with our cursor here, it's going crazy. <laughs> so, what you do is okay. Now uh, I'll just do this. I'll look at on here. And I'll just do this, and then I'll just do this, and then and you have to go there. Green button, share. Okay. So it's gonna have to lock it in. Yeah, I do not know. Uh, this here. Yeah, I think we're getting somewhere. Can you see the screen now? No, we are not able to see the screen. Uh, is your internet is weak? Uh, we're working on thing then. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it should be a screen. Yeah, but it's not putting it down. That would make sense. Yeah. That command. And you can't see it. Uh, Share screen. Yeah. You can't see it. No, we, can, we can't see it. We can't see your uh, screen now. You cannot. Cannot. No, we we can't see your presentation. Okay. Before we go. Uh, Doctor Sandeep, can you help them? Sandeep, can you hear me? Doctor Sandeep Biraris. Sandeep, put it to Tala Elkarki. Just Sandeep, roll up. That's mine. Yeah, I think. Yes, yes. Yeah, but that's not the right talk. Wait a second. Yeah, so you have to search the right talk. Here. PCL. Are you okay? No. Don't need to share screen. No, we can't see you at all. Uh, For some reason, we can't get it into the Zoom. We had it up uh, just a second ago. Uh, oh, go oh, oh, zoom in. So now we are in Zoom. And Is now... it PPT or Keynote? It's a PowerPoint. A PowerPoint. So yeah, yeah, no, okay. we got it now. We got it. Sure. How's that? Yes, yes, right. Yes. So okay. make it PPT view. Yes, coming. Full, full screen. Yeah, I'll mute, I'll just mute everyone. Yeah. All right. 
Yes, fine. Perfect. Well, and giving me the uh, honor and privilege to talk to you guys. Uh, it's been a good discussion we've had so far. I'm going to try and walk you through a little bit on the PCL reconstruction and how our approach is and uh, some of the pitfalls in uh, PCL reconstruction. So the PCL consists of two bundles, as we discussed a little bit earlier in our discussion. The two bundles is the antilateral bundle, uh, which, is play, which is the bigger and main bundle of the, of the PCL. And then you have a posterior medial bundle, which is the minor or smaller bundle of the, of the PCL. But we don't have, to, we should not neglect or forget our meniscal femoral ligaments, uh, which are in about 75% of the, uh, if you look at the cadaver studies, uh, the meniscal femoral ligaments are a visual or, or there in about 75% of the cadavers. Uh, and it's, you, know, you both have an anterior and a posterior ligament. And they actually contribute quite a bit to, uh, to the load on the, the intact knee. So they do have a stabilization uh, function in the knee. So we should not neglect these. A little bit of the anatomy of the PCL. Uh, it's a quite big uh, structure, about 38 millimeters in average in length. So it's uh, much bigger than the ACL. And it's, it's quite wide, it's about 13 millimeters at the widest point. Uh, and it has a large femoral footprint, which definitely gives us some challenges when we have to reconstruct this. Looking a little bit at the kinematics, as we talked about a little bit, the reasoning for tensioning at different angles is that if you're looking at the, the posterior medial bundle, that's the bundle that tensions in full extension in contrast to the anterolateral bundle that tensions in flexion. So that's one of the arguments for tensioning these graphs independently at different angles when we reconstruct. We use stress x-rays consequently on our PCLs in our workup. Uh, and from this paper from Laprade here showed nicely that if you have a more the side to side difference where we do a kneeling stress x-rays uh, with full weight bearing on the knee, then you see a posterior displacement of the tibia if you have some kind of involvement of the, of the PCL. And what we saw is that if you have less than eight, millimeter, eight millimeters of displacement, then you most likely have a partial tear. And compared to if you have about eight to 12 millimeters displacement, side to side difference, then we're talking about a total rupture of the PCL. If you do have more than 12 millimeters side to side difference, then we're talking combined injury. You pretty much, it's, it seems to be impossible from the cadaver studies that's been done that if you have more than 12 millimeters displacement, it, you have more structures involved than just the PCL. So this is very important if you wanna plan for, for surgery also. Landmarks are important when we are talking about surgery uh, and a lot of anatomical studies have been done and Laprade is uh, one of the main people behind this. And if we look at the anterolateral bundle, what we have to do is the placement of the of the footprint here is very, very high and difficult to get to sometimes. And it's pretty much between the trochlear point and the medial arch. I think from a surgical perspective, the trochlear point is easy to identify. The medial arch can be more challenging sometimes. And it sort of fills up when you do a tunnel uh, reaming uh, in that central part of that anterior lateral bundle. The posterior medial bundle, if you drop down a little bit, then you center the posterior medial bundle about eight, nine millimeters from the cartilage edge. And when you have your tunnel in there, you're about five to six millimeters from the cartilage edge. And you should have a bone bridge between the two tunnels about two to four millimeters. The, the center of the center is about 12 millimeters. Looking at the PCL and the tibia, uh, the center is about seven, eight millimeters from the champagne uh, glass drop off when you look over the posterior ridge. I'll get back to this uh, a little bit later on how we, we assess these points and how we get to it. So there are different techniques to do PCL reconstruction. We can talk single bundle transtibial, we can talk single bundle inlay techniques, double bundle transtibial, and double bundle inlay techniques. What I'm going to focus on in this talk uh, is, is the double bundle transtibial technique. So graph choices, we talked a little bit about from our discussion uh, the day before yesterday, Dr. Wade, that I, we heard that you don't have accessibility to, uh, to allografts. 
but autographs are definitely an option for PCL reconstructions, uh, but also allographs are, are, are a feasible um, graph to use. So looking at the different types of graphs, I think these are probably the three majorly used graphs uh, for autographs for PCL reconstructions. On the allograph side, I mean, Achilles, tibialis, anterior and posterior, and the quad tendon are, are nice graphs to work with. I think the quad tendon is of increasing interest and very interesting for also for PCL reconstruction because you can get a massive, good, solid graph, and you can actually get a double bundle type of graph with the quad tendon. The Achilles tendon is what we on a regular basis for our PCL reconstruction. Uh, it's a big, solid graft uh, with a lot of uh, tissue volume in, into the knee. For equipment, for when you do PCL reconstruction, the PCL guide is a must, I think. I think it's very difficult and dangerous to do PCL reconstruction without a PCL guide. Uh, you have to make up your mind whether you want to use auto or allografts. There are studies showing that non-radiated non-chemically treated allografts are equally as strong and as good as autographs. The C-arm is uh, definitely recommendable, especially in your beginning phase of doing PCL reconstruction. Uh, the more you've done, the better you get, uh, the more confident you get, maybe you can start uh, using the C-arm less and less. That's uh, individual, I think. For the PCL guide, Looking at this uh, type of guide, it gives you a nice protection. It gives you a nice uh, placement. So you get a good uh, aim at where you want to place your pin centrally. And if you look from the top and over the, the back of the edge, you see how it protects the pin from, from penetrating posterior into the dangerous structures. So as we talk about different types of techniques, the double bundle is the technique I'm going to talk about. I'm going to walk you through here how we do it uh, and why we do it. So portals are, of course, important when you do uh, ligament surgery. And I think for PCL, we do the same because a lot of times you have um, ACL involvement. So you should place your tunnels tight and high as you do for the ACL surgery, central, just off the patella tendon, medial and lateral. The lateral uh, portal, you will have to extend uh, in size uh, in order to pass your grafts. Then we have a supplementary portal, posterior medial, so you can get a nice view of the posterior part of the tibia. And here's a nice uh, um, video of how we do the posterior medial and how we get a view. When we shave on the back of the knee, this is the dangerous part. I like to do the tibia initially because this is a dangerous uh, part. And I think there's two reasons why I like to do this as the first. One is that I will have less uh, fluid excavation and less edema. Plus, as I said, it's the most dangerous and most uh, tedious part. So I like to get that done with before the knee swells too much up and I can sort of relax a little bit after I've done my, my tibia. What I do is I put my shaver into that posterior medial portal. I shave uh, the remnant of the tibial insertion of the PCL. I keep the shaver blade towards myself at all times so I don't turn around and expose the shaver blade to the posterior structures of the uh, popliteal artery and nerve. Then you, of course, have a little bit of uh, bleeding back there. So I use an RF probe to, uh, to supply the bleeding and uh, to continue to have a good overview. The question is to use a tourniquet or not. I prefer not to use the tourniquet. Uh, and the reason for this is that I, in general, in general, I don't use a tourniquet, but also if I will were to be unlucky and have a vascular injury, I would notice it right away. So when you clean off the tibial uh, insertion site and you have this beautiful view over the edge, I mean, a lot of times you can manage with 30 degree scope, but the 70 degree scope here will definitely be of help to get a good overview. Uh, but I think if you reposition the knee from that posterior uh, uh, slacking and you reposition an anatomical position, then you can really get a nice view with a 30 degree uh, scope. And what you want to do is you want to identify anatomical structures. So you start by, uh, by locating the, the bundle ridge, then you drop down to the, the white fibers that attach into the tibia, uh, and that's where you have your champagne glass drop-off area. If you perforate those fibers, 
the popliteal muscle will expose. And if you perforate there, you can get fluid extravasion into your lower leg. Uh, compartment syndrome has been uh, documented. Uh, personally, we have not had that experience, even though we perforated um, the, the fibers there. As we talked about using intraoperative uh, x-ray to place your pin centrally, you want to go six, seven millimeters in a proximal direction from the champagne glass drop-off. You can use your um, your C-arm and get a good view. Uh, make sure you don't have a posterior blowout of the tibia. We do one tunnel technique, 10 to 11 millimeters, depending on the size of the patient and the size of the graft. I think that's one uh, uh, comment I would like to make is that I personally use a 70 degree scope back there because I feel I get much more control. But uh, obviously uh, you can do it with a 30 degree as well. Well, you have to be careful here are the shiny white fibers, which are the root insertion area of the posterior medial and meniscal root. Their close uh, approximation, there's not a lot of space once you put a 10, 11, or 12 millimeter tunnel back there. And, and so you don't want to go too high, you got to take out that medial root. On the, here's a nice uh, anatomical overview of the uh, looking from the back of the knee, and you see how close a relation the shiny white fibers are to the PCL insertion on that tibia. So you really have to place this in the right place, otherwise you go from one disaster to another. If you go too high, you can detach the root. If you go too low, you're gonna post your blowout. Um, so again, use the PCL guide and the fluoroscopy. Here's uh, with the PCL, another type of PCL guide. You see a nice placement in there. Uh, the fluoroscopy assessing, you see how you have a good amount of space between the posterior wall and the pin, and the pin is not too high. Watch the pin, or when you ream, that you don't have a posterior continuation of that pin or the reamer, because the vascular, or the, the vessel's nerve are just three to five millimeters off there, so it's, you're not far off from a disaster. When you uh, when we ream the, the PCL tunnel, what we do is after we place our pin, we use a corette or a shaver blade, and we use that as a, a posterior protector to avoid the, um, the migration of that pin. And then we ream with a 10 or 11 millimeter reamer, depending on the size of the patient and the graft. Landmarks on the femur, which is for me the second stage, it seems like a natural uh, way of approaching if you go femur first, then tibia, and I know a lot of my colleagues do that. I prefer, as I said, the tibia first and then go femur. The landmarks in the femur we talked a little bit about, we do an 11 millimeter tunnel here. Uh, you go as high as you want, or you go as high as you can up to the choke bear point. Um, and then you have the posterior medial bundle, about seven to eight millimeters, depending on the size of the, the graft. And this, uh, this is uh, an anatomical picture showing where these bundles will be placed. So this is how it looks when we approach it. I typically leave my remnant of the PCL. A lot of times there's a lot of remnant. I use an RF probe and I take off the insertion site and I mark where I want to place my tunnels. Then what I do is after that, I put in my reamer and I, I use an acorn reamer and then I place it exactly where I want it, want it to be. And then I put my passing pin inside the reamer and then when I'm in the position where I want to do, I leave the reamer in there, I place my passing pin, and then I can ream afterwards. Then you don't have to, to measure out or eyeball where you want to be. That gives you a good idea of that you're not you're in that area you want to be, not too far off the cartilage, and right where you want uh, the reamer to be. I do the same thing for the, the posterior medial bundle. Uh, what I do is I elevate my hand a little bit, I have that two to four millimeter bone bridge between the tunnels. And then I place my passing pin again. I put my reamer on top uh, and then I ream. When you do it this way by elevating your, on your posterior medial bundle, you get diversion of the two tunnels. And I've never had a, a blowout between the two tunnels. Then you pass your, uh, your sutures. And and then you pass, then you're ready to pass your graphs here. So this is how it looks. 
And then when we pass our graphs, what I do is I actually pull both of the graphs into the tunnels uh, before I start putting interference screws in here. I prefer having both graphs in a tunnel in case that I should have that blowout or collapse of that uh, intermediate wall. We fix it with interference screws and in the femur. And then the interesting part comes. That's when you have to pass your graphs, your two graphs down through your tibial tunnel. This is where you have to extend that lateral portal in order to pass that graphs because they will loop back into the knee. What I typically do is I make sure that my graphs are aligned so they're not twisted because if they twist and you start pulling into the graph, they're gonna tension and tighten up and, and get all bundled up. So I, I sort of engage my anterolateral and posterior medial bundle into the tibia tunnel, and then I toggle the graphs through the, the tibia tunnel. And then, uh, then it, it's, it seems to slide quite nicely and easily through there. But again, you can run into issues here, and this is typically the place we run into issues. I always do an interoperative verification with the scope in, and this is for two reasons. I want to make sure I'm on the correct side of the ACL, that we haven't passed around the wrong side of the ACL. And then I want to make sure my graphs are not bunched up and I can tension these graphs without them being all bunched up and, and taking up a lot of volume in the knee. Then as we talked about how to fix on a tibia, we tension uh, the graphs, we do cyclic movements. Uh, and then we tension the anterolateral bundle first on a neutral rotated knee, 90 degrees of flexion. We use a bicortical screw with a washer. Uh, and then we put the knee in full extension. And this is where the original technique is made with a bicortical screw. But this is where we started to put a, a interference screw into the tibia uh, instead of the second bicortical screw. You test for stability. The reason why we didn't use washers is that you have less pain and the post and the pounding of the screw of the uh, uh, sorry the staple that you get a posterior displacement which you don't want to do. So this is the end result how it looks after we do a complete PCL reconstruction. This is pretty much the PCL, but what, what I want to talk a little bit about right, right now is uh, tunnel convergence. Or do you want questions now? We, we can have questions on this, and yeah. then we'll go on the tunnel convergence. Yes, okay. All right. Yeah. One, one second. One yes, second. Yes, yes. Uh, what we'll do is um, afterwards we can have questions now, and then Mark will talk about the uh, convergence. You see, because uh, and then the last talk I'll do next time because I I have to leave at uh, two ten. Uh, or you guys is, uh, I have to leave at 2.10, so Mark will then uh, finish it up. I will not give the last one. Go ahead, Mark. Okay. So what okay maybe, maybe, maybe last we can do it next time. Uh, I think yeah. we'll continue with the Mark. You can, uh, you, you can continue. Mark, Mark, I've got a question for you, because in India, we don't have the, uh, these allographs. Okay. Yeah. So when we, when we do the, uh, your double bundle PCL, uh, suppose you don't have the allograph. What is your choice for your uh, your autographs? I think so, for autographs, my the problem is that 11 millimeter uh, tunnel for your AL bundle is uh, is not with the auto. No, I know that's that's very difficult to get that large tunnels and that large graphs if you do a double bundle. Even a single bundle is, is tough with 11 yes. millimeters. I think, you know, as I said a little bit earlier, I think the quad tunnel is a really good choice here. It's a solid graph. If you do a full thickness quad tendon harvesting, you can pretty much harvest an 11 millimeter graft full thickness. And it comes almost in a natural double bundle setting. Freddie Fu and Volker Musa has published on this, uh, where they showed a double bundle technique with a full thickness quad tendon. So they use the rectus femoris part, which is separated in the proximal part of the quad tendon by fatty tissue and use that for the posterior lateral bundle, or posterior medial bundle. And then they use the main part of the second and third layer of the quad tendon for the anterolateral bundle. So it's definitely feasible to do that way. Yeah, but, but that time, is it possible to do the 11 any, any, any other question? Too? Yeah, uh, Dr. Lars, like uh, yeah, anytime you do a remnant preserving double bundle PCL, 
I mean, we do partly remnant preservation. We, I rarely take down the PCL remnant. I leave it be. And I'm, as I showed you with the RF probe, I mark my area on, the, on the, the femur and also I detach it on the tibia. You have to do that, but then you can leave the remnant there so you get a lot of volume in there. The question is the biomechanical function in the long run. We don't really know about that if it, if it heals into the, the, the allograft or, or the graft that you use. But you know, that's a good question because one of the functions of the remnants is that uh, there is good blood supply usually there. So if you have an allograft, for example, or a, um, what's a good uh, allograft, uh, the blood supply, rest of the blood supply in your remnants will help you get blood supply back up further, faster than usual. That's one thing. The other thing is that the proprioceptive function of the uh, I think uh, uh, loss is internet connection. Okay. No, Can you hear it? Can we? Uh, we yeah, can we can hear, hear you. Hear you. Yes, Professor, yes. Professor Lars, you go ahead. We have, your internet is okay, no problem. No, we can't. Yeah, so I think there are two issues for that. One is the blood supply. Mm -hmm. Secondly, is the neuro, are the nerves in the remnants? And both of those are good reason to uh, use part of the remnants if you can. However, for ACL, for ACL, you know, if you use the remnants there distally, you easily get a cyclops. And you have extension problems later. So I, I never yeah. use remnants for ACL, but for PCL, it might be a good idea, especially when Mark is, is using his allografts. But uh, doctor, like technical issue, what we get when we are keeping the remnants, usually like passage of the graft, that usually what uh, we do, like uh, uh, anterolateral bundle, we have to go above over the uh, bundle and uh, posteromedial bundle, we have to come from we need the uh, remnants. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, uh, it becomes all from, uh, difficult to pass the graph. Yeah, that's, of course, a problem that it, uh, you know, you have to, especially in the beginning, you have to be very careful of getting your tunnels free of all soft tissue. And if you use a lot of remnants, it's going to make it more difficult. But um, uh, people, some people believe in using it, and uh, there has been no studies showing that it is much worse or much better. So I cannot give you a better answer than that. But it definitely is a technical issue. If you both have an ACL that's intact, and you want to preserve your meniscal femoral ligaments on top, and then you want to preserve the remnant of the PCL, then you're starting to challenge yourself quite a bit. Uh, Roshan, yes. I have a question. Yes, yeah, 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 please, please, please go ahead. Uh, this question is both to Professor and uh, Mark. Uh, there is always a challenge to say uh, when ACL and PCL are injured, how to tighten your ligaments? Which one to do first? Whether we need to give posterior drawer and then fix the PCL first and then ACL? Because there are papers saying that when you do that, you don't know how much of uh, anterior drawer you are giving and then fixing, fixing the PCL. And some papers say that you need to fix ACL first and then do PCL. So do you have any instrumented guide or any guide to say that this is the amount of tension we give in anterior drawer while fixing the PCL? Or is just uh, an eyeballing to say that, you know, this is the anterior drawer that I give to fix the PCL? We, the answer is, uh, we don't have a guide. There is a guide available uh, from Stryker that uh, some people are using. Um, in uh, my uh, hands, uh, the guide is in my head. So I use, you know, I tighten the PCL in 90 and uh, 30 degrees of extent of uh, flexion. Or, or 90 and zero of flexion. And I uh, yeah. then go to the ACL full extension and then tighten that with about five pounds um, tensioning. So I don't have a more sophisticated way of doing that, uh, unfortunately. So if you can figure out a way to make a good guide, that would be very good. <laughs> I've got a question to you. When you do the ACL along with the PLC, suppose you are doing three tunnels on your uh, lateral uh, femoral condyle, so what is your trick? Please tell that because every time we are doing the three tunnels for your lapra and mm -hmm. also the lat tunnel for the uh, your central tendon, mm -hmm. then always we are in a uh, dilemma how to do it, it is 40 degree and all this. But what, how you do it? What is your trick for I'm us? 
Well, yeah, I think that uh, Mark will I show you okay. very clearly how he does uh, prevent the convergence of the tunnel. So uh, you should show those slides probably, Mark. Yeah. If we have no more questions on the PCL, I'll show you a little bit about tunnel convergence. Yeah, yeah. Tunnel convergence for the three tunnels on the lateral corner, lateral side, lateral femoral corner. Yeah. No. I'll show you that here in a second. So I'll talk to you a little bit about tunnel convergence and how to avoid it, uh, because it can be quite a hassle, as you see here. As you see here, there's a lot of uh, tunnels. There's a lot of real estate in, 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 uh, involved here. Uh, and, and you have to really think before you start just drilling away, because you can get into a lot of trouble. So Gilbert, let's see if I can get this to advance. That's the way it's still there. Uh, yeah. Just a second. Yeah. All right. Oh, oh. I just have to change a little bit here. There we go. So this paper is from uh, Gilbert and Lars uh, from um, from Settlement Clinic, which was part of Gilbert's PhD on uh, on how to avoid tunnel convergence in multi leg injuries. So I'll walk you through a little bit about that on pearls for PCL multi-legs. And as you see here, this is from our course in, uh, in Mackey's in Minneapolis, where we actually put in all the tunnels possible in a multi-leg knee. And it, it just looks like chaos. So you really, really have to, uh, to think this through before you start drilling away. Uh, um, if, you, if we look at the femur anatomy, we have the medial and we have the lateral condyle. Looking at the medial condyle, we talked about the double bundle PCL, then you have the superficial MCL and the POL tunnel. And on the lateral condyle, you have the ACL, your uh, FCL, LCL, and the popliteal uh, tendon. So that gives you a total of seven tunnels in the femur. Now, on the medial side, it's important to know your landmarks to avoid getting into issues. So anatomy is, of course, uh, in, uh, important here. And what I use as a rule of thumb is I use a three and five millimeter. So I find my medial epicondyle, I go three millimeters proximal and five millimeters posterior, and that's where my central part of the landmark of the superficial MCL is. For the POL, I use a one and three rule. So I go one millimeters distal and three millimeters answer of the, of the gastric tubercle. So you have your three tubercles that you can identify as landmarks there. And, and these are quite easily to palpate and find even in, in acute cases and chronic cases. So if you can palpate these out, you remember these rules, then you're pretty much safe to find the, the insertion site of different ligaments every time. Uh, then we have an additional uh, Superficial MCL, which is a deep or the, the deep part of the superficial MCL is about 12 millimeters distal of the uh, tibial joint space. And then the main insertion side of the superficial MCL is about 60 millimeters distally of the, of the, the joint space. For the POL, it's, it's sort of interweaned and, and, um, and, and merges into the semimembranosis. So if you find that insertion site of the semimembranosis, then you can find a good uh, insertion site for the POL tibial site. So if we look at these, here are tunnels that we're talking about, the superficial uh, MCL, the POL, and then you have the double bundle PCL, and that's how it would look. Now, how do we avoid uh, having, if you have four tunnels in there, I'll show you this in a second. So on the lateral side, again, anatomy is important. Uh, I think the sulcus of the popliteal tendon is often very easy to identify and palpate. I think it's more easy than to find the lateral epicondyle. Um, I typically do on the lateral side, there's often a remnant of the FCL or LCL. So I put a little whip stitch through the distal part of that LCL tendon, uh, uh, ligament, and you can pull on it and you can sort of feel the tensioning up here. If you, if you have a complete rupture and you don't have that effect, then you find that sulcus of the popliteal tendon, and then you can find that insertion side of the popliteal tendon up here. If you have one of the two, then you know this typically on the average about 18, 18, five millimeters between these two points. And it seems to fit every time. I mean, smaller knees will have a little smaller distance between the two points, but these are good 
rules to have and good way, uh, good uh, mechanisms to work by. The, the fibrillar insertion is a little bit more uh, laterally than you anticipate. If you do a Larsen reconstruction, you go through the anterior to the posterior part, but here we're trying to do an anatomical reconstruction and you go down in the lateral, anterior lateral side of the fibula head. And then you have a greater insertion area uh, for the popliteal tendon. We're sort of uh, customizing a little bit with the way we do the reconstruction. So here we're talking on lateral uh, uh, femur condyle one tunnel less than on the medial femoral tunnel. So looking at the relationship of all these tunnels, on the tibia we have a bunch of tunnels as well during ACL, PCL, MCL, POL, PLC. So you have five tunnels on the tibia. So first we have a POL tunnel we'll have to do, then we have a distal MCL, we have a, PC, a PLC insertion, and then we have an ACL and a PCL. So again, a lot of trafficking, a lot of uh, real estate uh, in the tibia. So five tunnels there. So in total, we've counted up seven tunnels in the femur. We've counted up seven, uh, five tunnels in the, in the tibia. And then in total, that gives you 12 tunnels. But what we haven't talked about here is lateral extraarticular tenodesis or ALL reconstructions, potentially an MPFL reconstruction, or which increases us to nine millimeters, uh, nine tunnels, and that gives us all of a sudden 14 tunnels. On the tibial side, we have one to two root tunnels potentially as well. So that gives us six to seven tunnels, and now we're up to 15 to 16 tunnels in a potentially small knee. So how do we avoid, especially on the PCL with a double bundle technique and a complete anatomical reconstruction with superficial MCL and POL, what Dr. Moatsi showed us here is <clears throat> if we drop our hand a little bit, about 40 degrees, and we go in a distal direction, then we should avoid any collision with the PCL tunnels. And the same for the POL tunnel, if we drop our hand 20 degrees and 20 degrees in a distal direction, we avoid, again, tunnel conversions with the PCL. So this is the key to avoid uh, tunnel conversions with a complete double bundle PCL reconstruction and an anatomical medial side reconstruction. For the lateral side, I think most of us do single bundle ACL. Again, here we have two tunnels for the posterior lateral corner. So what we do here is we drop a hand about uh, 35 to 40 degrees. I think in personal experience, I tend to drop about 30 degrees. I have had some issues when dropping at 40 that I tend to penetrate uh, the, the lateral part of the trochlea with the pins. So you have to be careful dropping it too much. <clears throat> so I do actually sometimes if I'm in doubt, I put my scope in just to make sure I haven't penetrated with the pin in there. So I drop my hand about 30 degrees. On the tibial side, there's also some, some tips and techniques on how we can avoid tunnel convergence here. Typically as a rule of thumb, if you drop four centimeters from the joint space, and that's where you put your ACL tunnel. Then you have another two centimeters to go on, and then you're about six centimeters to of the joint space, and that's where you put your PCL tunnel. If we go back to the PCL reconstruction and the placement of the, t of the tibia for the PCL, I think if you drop your hand six centimeters and you come out six to seven millimeters proximal from the champagne glass drop off, then per automatic, you avoid having a blowout back here. So ever since I've dropped my hand six centimeters down, six to seven millimeters proximal of the champagne drop-off glass, I have not had any penetration or blowout of that posterior tibia. And that's when I stopped using uh, radiographs for the PCL tibial tunnel. Then we have the collateral ligaments. We have to be a little bit careful here. If you look at the POL, if you do, uh, if you go straight for the tubercle, you will collide with the PLC tunnel in the tibia and you will collide with the PCL tunnel. So a, uh, Dr. Macho showed here is if we go 15 millimeters medial of Gertie's tubercle, you go right in between the ACL and the PCL tunnel. For the superficial MCL and the tibia, if you elevate or go proximal direction about 30 degrees, so you go in a distal direction with the, with the reamer, then you avoid colliding with the PCL uh, in the tibia. But be aware of the small knees. It depends on the size of the knees, especially when we're talking nine millimeters for the PLC, 10, 11, maybe 12 millimeters for the PCL. 
there's not a lot of space in between here. I think most of you have ever put your finger behind uh, when you do your posterior lateral approach and you realize how close in proximity that PCL and the PLC tunnel is. And you can actually have a blowout between those two tunnels. So be careful. You might have to downsize your tunnels a little bit on the smaller knees. And that was my tips and tricks on the tunnel convergence or how to avoid it. That was a thank you, Mark. That was that was too good. I think that was a real real crux of all the multi ligament injuries. That was too good. Excellent talk. So, any questions? Excellent, excellent, excellent. excellent. Uh, uh, Mark, Mark, was this study was done in uh, any uh, two dimensional uh, models or it is done in three dimensional model? Because this is very important when we speak about the knee, knee yeah. as per when we consider x, y, and z axis. So, the height, width, and the depth of the tunnel. But well, the, the study was done with uh, cadaveric knees that was CT scanned. And then with an animation program, they looked at moving the tunnels. They looked, uh, they drilled the tunnels, made the CT, or not drilled the tunnel, but made an imaginary uh, tunnel. And it was a special computer program that was developed for this. And then they moved the tunnels around different angles to see where do we avoid this. And some of the tunnels were fixed, like the PCL double bundle. You, there's limited amount of changing of, of direction on that uh, due to large uh, size and also due to the approach from the portals. So it's, it's very limited how much you can change your tunnel uh, placement of the PCL and also the ACL partly, I think, when we do an intermedial approach. So that was sort of the standard. That was the fem femoral tunnels for the ACL and the PCL. And, and they built... <clears throat> the posterior lateral tunnels and the uh, medial and posterior medial tunnels around the central tunnels. Hello. Hello. Any other question? Any other yeah, question? Mark, uh, Mark, Mark. Mark. Yes, Samir. Yeah, Samir. Roshan, can I ask? Yes, please, please go ahead. Yeah, Mark, uh, excellent presentation by you. But uh, I just want to know if there is a PCL as, uh, along with the MCL is there, and I want to do anatomical laparad MCL with PCL. PDL yeah. side, chances of collision. If you'll see for the PCL tunnel and the POL tunnel. For the PCL POL. And POL. Yeah, for, for the PCL POL side, tunnel. I'm asking of PBL side. We're talking P the medial side, right? PBL, yeah, medial side, PBL POL, side, yeah. and PCL for tibia. Yeah. And we should, if we stay with the tibial side now, the tibia, and we talk about PCL tunnel in the tibia, and we talk POL and superficial MCL. <clears throat> so what you do on the, should I find the slide again? Yeah, yeah, please. Oh, that, uh, that, is, that, is, that is more explanatory. I'll just go back here, uh, just a second. Right here. So this is... Uh, Pretty much the slide right here. So, what you normally what we've been doing is aiming aiming for the girders tubercle for the POL. But if you go more medially uh, for the girders tubercle, because the girders tubercle for the PLC, that's where you want to exit about just around the girders tubercle. Now, if you go a little bit more medial with your POL, then you avoid the PCL tunnel in the tibia, and at the same time, you also avoid the PLC tunnel in the tibia. For the superficial MCL, you, you elevate or you raise your arm in the cranial direction about 30 degrees. So you go in a distal direction with your reamer or your, your pin and your reamer uh, in the tibia. And that, that way you avoid colliding with the PCL. So if you, if you remember these charts that I've shown you here, if you remember those 40 degrees, 20 degrees, 30 degrees, and 15 millimeters and 30 degrees, then you should, I will say after we've implemented this, I have, I will not say I never had, but it's very, very rarely that I have a tunnel condition now. Yeah, thank you. No problem. Yes, Mark, that was too good. But I yeah, think- Yeah, Dr. Mark? Yes. 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 Ranjit. Yeah. Dr. Mark, when you plan for tunnels, in the tibia, medial femoral condyle, when you plan for a PCL double bundle 
and superficial MCL and POL tunnels. Then apart from directions, when you are doing uh, four tunnels in a smaller knee, yeah. do you decrease your uh, tunnel diameter? Absolutely. Of all the tunnels. Absolutely. Or only direction well, will solve the purpose. I think some of the graphs will, will limit how much you can decrease or decrease your, your tunnel size. So it, it depends a little bit on that. But I mean, most of the times it, 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 it walks hand in hand. If you have a smaller knee, smaller patient, you have a smaller graft. <clears throat> so I pretty much don't ream my tunnels until I've harvested my grafts. Uh, to make sure that I don't make too big tunnels. And it, you, you want to make it easy for yourself and avoid getting into issues. However, when you have allografts, you can choose your size of your graft. <clears throat> but you shouldn't be systematically saying that the PLC, we do nine and nine millimeters in the femur, we do nine millimeters in the tibia, and we do six millimeters or seven millimeters in the fibula head. Because if you have a young lady about 155, 160 centimeters tall, you don't want to put nine millimeter, two times nine millimeter tunnels for your PLC in the femur. So you definitely want to adjust it into the size of the patient. Okay, thank you. No problem. Mark? Yes. How often you encounter arthrofibrosis when you make so many tunnels? And second question is, do you do anything for the second fracture that you have showed on the x-ray? There was a yeah, well, small second fracture, avulsion of the uh, lateral tibial margin. Second. Uh, oh, the second. Uh, to answer the second question first, in tradition, we have not done anything with the second fracture. I think there are a couple papers out there showing that it doesn't make a big difference whether you do something with the second or not. Uh, you can debate the biomechanics of the sagong, uh, and with the, the hot topic of the anterolateral aspect of the knee, it definitely is a question that needs to be raised again. And I think it would be interesting to look at it from a more modern perspective with the knowledge we have today. But to answer your question, no, we do not do anything directly with the sagong fracture. If we do, however, have <clears throat> a huge avulsion, and we do a posterolateral corner re reconstruction. I have been tempted to suture it in with an osteo suture, or even place an anchor in that uh, osteochondral or um, uh, the bony fragment. Um, whether it has a difference to make, I'm not really sure. Um, the first question that was something I forgot. Arthrofibrosis. Yes. So arthrofibrosis, I would say we have definitely, from when I started doing multi-legs, it was not uncommon. Nowadays, very rarely do we have arthrofibrosis. And the cases that we do have arthrofibrosis are the acute cases. However, I think my, my sort of gut feeling on this is two things. It's definitely the, the energy of the trauma as one and number two is the compliance of the patient. We're super aggressive on rehabilitation. We're super aggressive on mobilization of the knee initially. So the day after surgery, our patients are kicked out of bed, mobilized with the crutches and working with our physios before they get discharged from the hospital. And really a lot of emphasis on physio rehab, a lot of emphasis on quad activation, uh, and active range of motion and also passive. We have a really close collaboration with our physios, uh, not only at the hospital, but also in the city and in uh, the community. So the physios are really, really uh, highly respected in Norway. They're highly educated and they work very, very close uh, with our patients. So that's fortunate for us. So I would say after that, Immobilizing the knees uh, quick, quickly and rapidly, we have very few cases uh, of arthrofibrosis. I would probably say we're probably around 5%. Mark, I've got a question. Suppose he's a young fo soccer football player with explosive pivot, who is very young, he has got explosive pivot. What is your indication of doing your lateral extra articular procedure and how you do it? So we use a modified Lemur technique. 
for extraarticular tenodesis, we don't do an ALO reconstruction. Uh, and in a case like that, I would look into the reason for this uh, high grade pivoting. And I think a lot of the times you find your explanation in a posterior lateral root tear, uh, which is concomitant with that ACL injury. And I think um, if you stabilize both the ACL and you, you, you uh, stabilize the posterior lateral root, a lot of that pivoting diminishes or disappears. But at the same time, I would not be afraid of doing an LAT with the modified Lemaire technique. Okay. I will ask you one question of what uh, Swamanendu wants. Do you do pivot shift after doing all these reconstructions? In a multi-leg, no. In an ACL setting, yes, but I will never let the resident do it. I do it myself and I do it gently. Yes, thank you, sir. Because there's a lot of force on there. And if I do a root reconstruction, I'm very, very careful on doing pivoting. How you decide part of that this guy will need LET? I look at the preoperative pivoting. If there is no other reason than that meniscal root, Yes, meniscal root is not there. Then I would, uh, if it's a, it's a, an athlete that wants to return to a pivoting activity, then I would definitely consider doing an LET even on the initial case. So you have tried two, three jumps. Just a minute, I'll mute. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Thank go you, ahead. thank you, Mark. Thank you. No uh, yes, 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 Tonpe, Vivek, yes. Uh, Mark, one, one yes. question. If you have to, like, if we don't have access to the, you know, the allographs, so if I, you have to take the minimum requirement of the PCL diameter, and let's say we are doing only single bundle, what should be the minimum requirement? Because we have seen, you know, the grade one laxity coming a bit often. I would not say that it is zero if the grade one laxity is quite common. So what should be the minimum thickness of the graph which can provide a good support? I think it's a good question. I don't think anybody really has the answer for that. And again, it's individual on the size of the patient, maybe even the concomitant injuries of the, the knee and also the activity demand of, of the patient. Uh, if you have a 60-year-old uh, multi-leg injury, low energy, I wouldn't worry so much on the, on the diameter as, com yes. as in contrast to a 20 year old. So I think these, these are complex cases and I don't think always there is a right and wrong answer. Uh, I think what we want to do is assess a best option. And of course, try to go as large as possible with what you have uh, would be my advice on that. So that's why I like the quad tendon for these cases because you can really get a massive amount of graft in there and it's solid, it's really nice. So, so, no, even if whatever you say, let's say he's a young and active. So, what's your take? 9, 10, 11? I mean, if I can go, huh? if I, if I can go 11 and there's enough room in that intercondylar notch for both an ACL with a maybe 9 or 10 and then 11 PCL, I'll definitely go for that. Okay. Uh, but I, I will also have to be careful of stuffing that we don't get an over, over packed. Uh, Stuffed uh, knee. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think Avnish had a question. Yes, yes. Don't pay, don't pay. Yeah, yeah. Don't pay. You have to unmute. You have to unmute yourself. Yeah, uh, Mark, when there is one question, if there is, we don't have uh, access for the allograph, but uh, suppose for the managing, in managing with an atograph, what is the choice for the PCL and ACL and in multilegament injury? So at our place, our primary choice for the PCL. Are you asking what yes. we're using for primary choice of graft? Yes, 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 primary choice of the graft. So uh, for multi-leg staging or uh, setting, we use for the PCL, we consequently use an Achilles allograft. We have recently been purchasing these through Allosource in the US, but just within this last three quarter of a year, we have started our own harvesting team. So now we harvest good solid Norwegian grafts, and these grafts are non-radiated, non-chemically treated. Uh, so we use consequently an Achilles allograft for the PCL. For the ACL, 
I think uh, looking at my colleagues, our number one choice is a BTB. I'm a huge quad tendon guy, so I would definitely not mind going for a quad tendon. Uh, so I use 95, 98% of my cases, quad tendon or BTB on ACL. Okay. And very rarely do I use a hamstring for ACL. Those are special cases. And then for the for the posterior lateral corner, we use consequently an Achilles allograft that we split in two. We have also used a semi T and gracilis autographs, where we use the semi T double for the POL uh, for the popliteus and the gracilis double for the uh, LCL. Now that's where you run a little bit into issues if you have a medial side injury at the, at the same time because studies show that if you harvest the media or the, the hamstrings, you do weaken your medial side 40%. So yes. what we do on the medial side is typically we augment, we do an augmentation repair or fix it. We harvest the, the semi-T and then we leave it attached to the pestans arenas and we do an insertion of an anchor uh, or a tunnel technique, six centimeters distal of the joint space and we pull it in the right direction up again uh, to the insertion side on the femur. So we augment, we leave the remnant of the MCL there. And sometimes we reattach if it's a capsular injury. Then we do sometimes go on the contralateral side to harvest the hamstrings from there if needed or a BTB. Okay. Mark, Mark what he's asking is before you got the allografts, yeah. uh, what you used to do? What you used to do? Because we don't have allografts here. What was... Yeah. So my preferred yes, choice there, if I did not have an access to allographs and I had to do a multi-leg, if we say the whole, whole, whole uh, thing here, I would go for a quad tendon, uh, PCL from the same knee. Yes. I would go contralateral BTB for the ACL. I would do the semi-T ipsilateral for the medial side posterolateral, contralateral knee for the hamstrings. Okay. We'll not use any peroneal graft, peroneal longus. We don't have experience with it, but I know I spoke with Dr. Getgood about this and he likes using it and he's using it more and more. So maybe that's one of the, the areas I have to explore a little bit better and become more knowledgeable. But I definitely, from what I hear from colleagues, it's a great graft to work with. Yes, yes. Okay. We have we have we have good experience of taking peroneus longus graft for multi ligament injury, especially yeah. or maybe especially for the PCL reconstruction. We are very thick. Yeah. Peroneus longus is a very very thick graft, and you can yeah. easily also, also get length almost, is length is length is very good. Yeah, length, so yeah. good length and yeah. good yeah. diameter. You yeah. can make it eleven to yeah. twelve. Uh, ten eleven. Easily, easily. You can make ten eleven. Yeah. Uh, I'll come visit you guys and you can teach me on the perineal tendon. <laughs> Don't worry. We, we want to come to Norway rather than you coming to Mumbai. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Nor Norway is more fascinating than uh, India. <laughs> Any other question know. before we break? Because it's almost 6 o'clock. Okay, okay. No other question, I think, from uh, nobody is wasting. Yes. Yes, no, Rajkumar. 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 Rajkumar is waiting. Yeah, Dr. Rajkumar. Mark. Yes. Uh, just one uh, second. Just yes, one yes, second yes. here. I, yes. I actually have Uh, I actually have a patient waiting for me. Yes, yes. yes. In two minutes, we'll just finish this question and then you can leave. Yes, sorry. Yes. Mark, yeah. sorry to hold you back uh, from your consultation, but uh, this is a quick question. Yeah. Uh, I know you've done a lot of work on using quads. Yes. Uh, quads is one of my go-to graft for PCL reconstruction. Yes. How happy are you to go to sleep after doing a quads PCL reconstruction? I'm quite happy um, because I think it's, uh, like I said, it's a good solid graft. Uh, and I think I, you can debate a little bit on the double tunnel, uh, double tunnel technique on the, on, the, on, the, on the quad tendon. I think, you know, I prefer to go single bundle if I use a quad. I know uh, I spoke with Folko about this and, and he likes the double bundle technique. From my, from my perspective, perspective on it and from my anatomy work with the quad tendon, what I found, which raises a little bit of a concern is that the rectus, I did not find any direct fiber insertions to the patella. 
So what I found is a direct or a merging of fibers into the second layer of the VMO and the VL. And that would be my concern that it might be a more of a dynamic uh, type of stabilizer. And would I rather put that, that stability and stress moment and those extra forces into a one tunnel technique and maybe get a greater strength overall by using a one tunnel mm -hmm. technique. That could be my argument for it. Just mark one small question. How, when, yes. you take your, when you take your this uh, quad tendon, do you use that specialized this 10 millimeter knife, double double knife for that or how you take that? No, I, I, I use that from the storage equipment. I yes, used yes, it yes. for a while. I, I don't like it to be honest. Uh, there is a huge learning curve. You can get into a lot of trouble. You can get triangular graphs and you can get uh, chisel uh, shaped graphs by cutting out too early. Uh, also, I did a biomechanical study showing that the partial thickness of the quad tendon versus a full thickness is about half the strength of the full thickness. So I go, I go, I convert it back to open surgery, classical harvesting, open technique, uh, and um, and then harvest the full thickness. I leave the the, the synovial uh, intact, and then I harvest as much as the full thickness as I can. Okay, okay, thank you. Mark, one last question. Hare? Sir, Nicholas, sir, a question. Sir, you, how many questions? He needs to go for ca ca cancel. I'll do two <laughs> more questions. No, no. <laughs> Sorry, sir, one last yes, question. Sir. Yes, last, last. This is Roshan, last. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. yes. <laughs> uh, see the menisco uh, tibial ligaments or menisco femoral ligaments. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, they also contribute 28% of your stability to the PCL. We yeah. never do anything to that. Even when we see that they are torn. And I think that is the final thing that we need to do in PCL to have a better sleep in the night. That is what I would like to ask you. I definitely think the meniscal femoral ligaments is a massive stabilizer. I've seen it in the lab, especially when we take down the PCL. You have some stability left. You still feel a, a lax knee. But as soon as you take down that meniscal femoral ligament, that's when it really changes character, I think. So I, I totally agree with you. And that's why I preserve my first PCL cases. I just took them down. I mean, I didn't think about it. But after working in the lab, I definitely think they're much more important than we anticipate. Thank you, Mark. Well, I think, that's, I think, that's, your, I think, that's, your, yeah. that's your internal brace right there. Those are your meniscal femoral ligaments. Yes. Okay, Mark, uh, we okay. thank you very much for a thank you very, very much. informative yeah. lecture, a complex lecture that you make uh, made so simple. I must say you really made a mark on us. Perfect. That's good. So Thanks, it's it's a your mark, you. Mark Strauss. Thank you very much for a wonderful talk. We really, really enjoyed it. Give my regards to Dr. Lars. And we will that. fix another, uh, Dr. Lars in Boston. Give my regards to him and tell him that we will fix another meeting for him to talk on rehab, the, uh, the return to Absolutely. sports after ligament injury. So at that time, even we'll like to have you. We'll talk and we'll discuss out, final out the program for next meeting. Thanks. Perfect. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. I'll, have I'll a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just stop.